Thank you for joining me on the Meg Ellison Show. I'm delighted to have joining me on the phone. Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty President and General Counsel, Rick Essenberg. Good morning, Rick. How are you? Good morning. How are you? Good, thank you. Happy Monday. Same Frankly, you. Yeah, usually I say on Tuesdays, oh, thank God it's not Monday, but you know what? As I said to you off air, I had a really nice weekend. Hope you did as well. Did, did you have pretty decent weather? What? Oh, my gosh, weather? Weather down in uh, Milwaukee? No, we had terrible weather oh. uh, Saturday, but Sunday was better. Oh, good, good. Yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of work to be done outside to get ready for. I won't say the I won't say the W word, but uh, it's coming. Uh, although, I'll hang on to fall weather as long as I can. That's for sure. That's yeah, nice. So let's talk about and we're, we've been reporting, and you know it's kind of funny because it's it's like uh, when when Robin Voss um, says uh, Speaker Robin Voss doesn't talk about uh, Judge. Janet Protasiewicz, uh, then evidently impeachment isn't on the table. But then when he talks about her, it's it's kind of funny how the how the media works. But um, you know, I think he's been as far as I'm in my conversations with him, he's been consistent and wanted to wait and see what happens with his redistricting case. I know that uh, Will has filed a motion to intervene and would like. Obviously, we we don't want you to reveal your whole legal strategy, but. If you can comment on what you can, and I don't know if you can give us some hope about uh, what we're to, well, what what we should anticipate is coming. Well, you know, we filed the case that led to the maps that we have now. It was called the Johnson case, and we represented a group of voters, and uh, the maps had to be redrawn because they were no longer equal in population after the 2020 census. And we told the court, look, you should redraw these maps. You should do as little as is necessary to bring them back into proper apportionment. And uh, the court agreed to do that. There were um, twists and turns in the litigation uh, over the latter part of 21, the first part of 22. Um, But ultimately, the court decided to adopt the maps that we had in the middle of April of 2022. Now we're back about a year and a half later, The composition of the court has changed, and uh, the new petitioners are coming in, and they're saying the maps are invalid. Uh, They are raising either issues that were brought up and rejected in Johnson, or they are raising arguments that could have been raised in Johnson, but were not, and are in any event not very good. I mean, is this what we are going to have to come to expect? It's like a tennis match. Okay, so depending on the makeup of the state Supreme Court, um, you know, that I, you know, and as I remember, Democrats were for fair maps before now they're against them. I know that's sort of the latest mantra. But, I mean, is this, I guess, is this what we have to expect going forward? Is that the, uh, depending on which political party, uh, is is questioning something is that we're going to have to be anticipating some sort of lawsuit and uh, we're going to be dependent on um, legislators in black robes. Well, I hope not, uh, because uh, you think of why judges wear black robes. The idea is supposed to be that the identity of the judge doesn't matter. Who he or she is doesn't matter. They're neutral. They wear black. They're indistinct. And uh, the, the, the problem here, though, is that when judges believe they have a great deal of discretion, when they insert themselves into political differences, uh, litigants are going to notice that, and they're going to try to take advantage of it. So you ask, is this something that we can expect to see in the future? Well, if the court permits this, if the court uh, now faced with a number of cases that um, are seeking to overturn issues that were settled, if they do that, then that's going to be a new tool of partisan warfare. And, you know, neither side is going to stand down. They're going to do this every time the composition of the court changes, and it will change. Do you, 
I mean, what's your opinion on this? Should she recuse herself or should she have recused herself based on what she her campaign promises? Well, you know, we weren't involved in the briefing of that in the redistricting case. We decided to that was not our role to get into that. Um, I, I think it's a serious question. Uh, she gave her reasons for not recusing. My guess is that if the uh, legislature doesn't like the outcome of the case, they will try to raise that issue before the U.S. Supreme Court, and we'll see. Well, I'm I'm still looking. I'm still grasping for some hope here. Do we have any to? I mean, to anticipate. I mean, because I think ultimately what Democrats want to do is well. I I think their end game is just to create chaos before this upcoming 2024 presidential election. But beyond that, I mean, it, it almost seems as if, it seems as if they want to redistrict because they 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 realize that they're not going to be in power unless they change somehow are change the makeup of the individual legislative districts. Well, so what they've done here, we talk about where the case is going to go. Um, one issue that has sort of permeated this whole thing, permeated Johnson, uh, is whether or not uh, courts could conclude that something is a partisan gerrymander. Now, without getting into an elaborate discussion of it, that's a very complicated question. Uh, the way that people tend to talk about it in public is um, tremendously oversimplified. They look at the aggregate vote for all Democrats in all legislative races. They see that it, it is uh, higher than the number of seats that are won by Democrats, and they say something must have been rigged, to use a famous term. And it, that's not true. You can't reach that conclusion because Democratic voters are more geographically concentrated. So the more sophisticated argument that they could make is, well, we know Republicans are going to have an advantage, but they made their advantage um, too much. The problem with that and the reason that the U.S. Supreme Court has decided that it will not hear these claims is that there really is no neutral way of determining how much is too much. And to some extent, this court recognized that when it decided to take this current redistricting case as an original action, because it said it wouldn't consider claims of partisan gerrymandering, because that would involve a lot of fact-finding, and they don't have time for that. So they're focusing, uh, there's another issue in there, I don't think it works, um, but they're focusing on this one little issue about municipal islands, that uh, districts in Wisconsin are supposed to be contiguous, but sometimes they're not because uh, there will be a detached municipal island that will be put together with the municipality, which is over in the next district. So I don't know if it's true in Wausau, but but a lot of cities and towns in Wisconsin, they have their boundaries, but then they have a little patch, which is three, four miles away. And sometimes nobody lives there. Sometimes it's a waste dump, it's a golf course, but occasionally small numbers of people do. Now, that has never been thought to be wrong to keep these municipal islands together. They're now saying that that makes the districts non-contiguous. For 50 years, we've been doing it the way that it was done in these maps. They're asking the court to suddenly discover that it was unconstitutional all along. I don't think the court should do that. But if it does, it's a relatively simple fix. It does not involve redrawing all the maps. And uh, but at the end of the day, we'll see what the court do, does with it. So on a, another topic, uh, I know that obviously many of our listeners are concerned about the Wisconsin Elections Commission and uh, uh, Megan Wolf in particular. Is there any recourse or is there is there a way to legally remove her from her position and and so we can perhaps move forward and i mean i guess i question you know who who are they going to replace her with and will there be problems with the next person i you know that's always my concern well I mean, that's what there's going to be litigation about um you know there was this dispute um 
a couple of years ago about a DNR commissioner who, uh, you know, Governor Evers had nominated his replacement, but the Senate hadn't approved the replacement. So the question was, could this guy continue in office? And the court issued a decision that basically said, well, you know, uh, he's still there, so there's no vacancy. So he gets to sit basically until the Senate approves a replacement. The question is, how does that case apply to the somewhat different case of the election commissioner, who is not nominated by the governor, but is selected by the uh, commission itself, and there's a provision in there for what happens when the commissioners can't agree. I think it's arguably a different uh, situation, but that's all going to have to be settled out by the courts. And at that point, if uh, all the death settles and uh, Ms. Wolf still has her position, then I suppose the um, legislature could consider whether they wanted to remove her by impeachment or uh, a different process called a dress, which has a higher burden to get it going, but doesn't really require uh, a finding of any type of corruption or wrongdoing. So first court, then impeachment? I mean, is that the order of... Well, impeachment or address, if in fact the legislature decides it wants to do that. But I think you're always going to find that the legislators are um, reluctant to do impeachment. Impeachment is supposed to be an extraordinary remedy. And and they've always got their eye on what, as politicians must do, they always have their eye on what the politics of this situation is. And, and historically, you know, people don't like impeachment. They don't like a lot of infighting among politicians because it makes it seem to them that the politicians aren't doing their job. So um, whether that will happen or not is is something that I can't say. Okay, so finally, uh, school choice uh, here in Wisconsin is under, I guess, under threat now because of this uh, bozo up in Minocqua that uh, really has is is not talented at brewing beer um but uh evidently he i, I haven't tasted any i don't know <laughs> well i i i've i've read some of the reviews and uh, okay. i'm, I'm be, being a little bit facetious but uh it seems it seems as if a brewer doesn't want to uh, a beer brewer doesn't want to um allow parents the right to choose the best individualized plan for their child for school. And I know that Monaco Brewing Company has uh, filed a lawsuit. I, I, I'm fairly certain that you're part of this this group of organizations in Wisconsin that is in support of school choice. Yeah, we are, and we're planning to intervene in that case, too. Um, and if, if the court takes it. Now, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, the plaintiffs in that case... Uh, uh, decided to bring it as an original action, and we've talked about this before. It's a case that starts in the Supreme Court. It doesn't go through the Circuit Court and the Court of Appeals. It, and that means, typically, for a case to be an original action, there has to be um, uh, really no factual issues, because the Wisconsin Supreme Court is not a court that conducts trials with witnesses. It's not what it does. It it, it reviews the case after that has happened, and it decides whether the law has been followed for the most part. And so uh, the, the problem with the case that's been brought here, I, I don't think it's a particularly good case. Um, I think it makes a series of arguments that um, what lawyers will often say prove too much, uh, and that means if this is true, then... Uh, Basically, the whole school financing system in Wisconsin is toast, uh, and I don't know that um, I don't know that anybody really wants to go down that road. But um, but even no matter what you think of the merits of the legal argument, the case is complicated. It's very very complicated. It's really impossible to imagine it being handled without a trial, and. Traditionally, the court will look at that and, and say, well, you know, we can't do that. You're going to have to go back down to the circuit court and you're going to have to uh, file it there and you're going to have to work your way up and maybe we'll see it sometime in the future. Um, again, don't know whether that'll happen. Um, 
don't think it's a very good case, but you know, you always take everything seriously. And, um, uh, so, um, you know, this is another issue that's now, uh, one that was thought to be settled. The constitutionality of school choice was upheld in the nineties for gosh sakes. And now the composition of the court has changed and somebody is running in and trying to change everything. And, uh, that's not good for the state, and, and it really isn't good for the image of the court, and we'll see what they do. So I know that the left, going back to uh, the Protosewitz, well, so-called impeachment, I know that the left was hoping for a smoking gun when uh, requesting the names of those that Speaker Voss was uh, advising. And, uh, I mean, it, it, I guess it's been revealed that their former justices of the Wisconsin Supreme Court, uh, Pat Rogensack and uh, John Wilcox and Dave, David Prosser, is there, any, is there anything wrong with uh, reaching out to former justices of the Supreme Court for advice? Well, you know, here's the thing, and it, and it may surprise some people out there, but um, politicians, particularly thoughtful ones, um, they reach out to constituents and people for advice all the time. Um, uh, you know, sometimes it might even be me. And I don't think that there was anything wrong with the speaker <laughs> attempting to um, resort to the expertise of uh, some people who he understood knew more about this than he did. I cross her, as I understand it, told him that he didn't think that the uh, Justice Protege would, uh, uh, should recuse. Um, I sort of suggest to me that this wasn't the situation where the fix was in and where Voss was just going to get whatever answer he wanted. Um, you know, there are circumstances in which this could become a government body with regular meetings and then potentially subject uh, to the open records law. But um, I think that this was, uh, I don't think this rose to that level. And, uh, and even if it did, that's a technical violation, and it's not uh, – uh, I, I don't think there's anything nefarious about this. I think that, uh, uh, you know, the speaker was just trying to get smart on this issue, and he asked, you know, people he could think of who he thought would give him a fair and honest answer. And um, I don't know what the others said, but uh, um, apparently, you know, Prosser told him what he didn't want to hear. and. And, and my understanding is that the speaker acknowledged that and said, well, you know, I asked you for your honest opinion, so thank you. Well, and that's that's good information to, to have because I think there are those that, well, that make assumptions without having all the information. And, and I mean, I've, I've known Robin Voss for a number of years, too, and I think that he uh, he doesn't act unilaterally. I mean, he does seek out the advice of, of others when, before he uh, makes decisions. And I mean, that's part of the strategy in being the speaker um, in here in Wisconsin. Well, Rick Essenberg, thanks for joining me this morning. I'm glad I didn't have to send Sister Mary Margaret to find you. Uh, that would have triggered childhood trauma. <laughs> Well, I'm glad that there was no trauma involved in this uh, conversation this morning. I hope you have a great week. Thanks you for too. all you do for was I mean for us here in Wisconsin. I do appreciate it. I suppose anytime something like this comes up, it's job security, uh, and actually, it seems as if you're adding new associates all the time. And I mean that's comforting for me, but it's also in the same respect, it's depressing that we have to always be gearing up for the next lawsuit against. Uh, someone on the left that's trying to pull a fast one. Well, thank you. Thanks. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Thanks. If you'd like more information about Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty, you can go to will-law.org.